BioCentury This Week is brought to you by Biogen IDEC, transforming breakthrough science into new hope for patients around the world. Your trusted source for biotechnology information and analysis, BioCentury This Week. Janet, one of the first things to kind of take a step back, the law calls for FDA to de designate uh, which drugs are breakthrough drugs. Mm -hmm. Companies submit their, their applications. How do you avoid the kind of Lake Wobegon effect where every single um, CEO of every biotech company is going to think that their drug is a breakthrough? I'm sure that they do. How are you going to actually evaluate what a breakthrough is? Well, we hope that everybody develops drugs they think are going to be breakthroughs, but we know that many are called fear chosen. In fact, very few end up being breakthroughs. So what we are doing with breakthrough therapy is asking for clinical data uh, that's of a large response of some sort, okay, unprecedented. So we want the, uh, the treating clinician, some, the doctor who takes care of these patients, if he saw this response early, you know, in early drug development, if, he, if his patients had this kind of response, he or she would know they were dealing with something different that maybe is going to change the whole face of the disease. Is, is there room for innovation in biosimilars? Is, it gonna, is India, for example, going to have a competitive advantage either in a manufacturing costs or the regulatory side? Um, on, on biosimilars the way that it has had in generic drugs? Well, interesting you ask that question because I really think the innovation in biosimilars, apart from developing new approaches or new technologies to develop uh, biosimilars, is really going to come from regulatory innovation. I believe that uh, India's uh, biosimilar guidelines uh, need to be very innovative. And these uh, guidelines are really going to look at how quickly you can take products into the market uh, with very l limited but key clinical trials. Well, what do you think that um, FDA, most people don't think of FDA as an agency that's involved in innovation or yeah. helping competitiveness, but I think that you, you view it that way. What, I do. I think it's a critical component of our mission to work as hard as we can to translate advances in science and opportunities um, to improve or protect health into real world products and, and for you, people who need them. Can you give some examples then of, of what FDA is doing or well, could I'm, do? Well, I'm looking very hard at, at the whole system that affects our ability to translate these opportunities in science into products. FDA has a critical role to play. We're not the only factor that makes a difference, and I think if we're really going to make a meaningful and sustainable difference, we have to look at the whole ecosystem. But within FDA, clearly, you know, taking a hard look at our regulatory pathways and procedures and how can we streamline and modernize them, and we've taken that very seriously in both the drug arena and the device area, and it's an area where we're continuing to work. And, I also mm -hmm. do want to emphasize that I think that that building a foundation of science that supports both swifter and surer drug development and regulatory review is crucial to our goals. Dr. Collins, we've been talking about uh, the budget situation for NIH and the kind of chipping away that inflation is doing, but you're actually facing a, a cliff, if you will, um, the, the threat of sequestration coming up uh, in January. What, is, what would sequestration mean for NIH? Congressional Budget Office has estimated that if sequestration happens on January 2nd, uh, 2013, that NIH would lose in one fell swoop 7.8% uh, of our budget, about $2.6 billion. That would happen already three months into the fiscal year. It would mean by their estimate uh, that we would lose the ability to fund about 2,300 grants that we otherwise plan to support. And that, I want to stop you right there because it's something I think uh, people don't understand. I don't quite understand it. If you're talking about losing 7.8 percent of your budget, why does that mean that a quarter of your grants can't be funded? That's a good question. Basically, we give grants over multiple years. Science doesn't operate on a one-year cycle. The average grant length that NIH gives out is four years. 
That means that about three quarters of our budget in any given moment is tied up in already made commitments to research that we funded the year before or the year before that. So that if you get a sudden slam in your budget on a given moment, the only place you have flexibility, unless you're going to do something really quite drastic, is the new grants. And then the new grants, which is one quarter of your budget, take the entire load of the damage. And hence, this would end up being the worst year that anybody could ever remember as far as your chance to get started in a new research project. You're watching BioCentury This Week.